So um, I just want to welcome Peter here with us today. It is a, a big honor to have you here at Learn Free. Uh, we've all really come to respect uh, your voice uh, out there on social media and so on, just uh, highlighting the issues um, in respect of childhood and learning and um, the freedom that children should should have in order to sort of grow up happy and healthy and um, as whole as possible. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for that, Peter. And I, you know, I know that um, whatever you've got to say to us today, we're going to all it's going to keep us thinking. So um, what I would like to do is hand over to you. So the session is being recorded. If there's anyone who doesn't want to appear on the recording, uh, you know, you can just turn your camera off. Um, and Peter's got a document. I will just refresh that in the, if one of the volunteers could just copy and paste that back in the chat for anyone who's new to the session. You can link on that and have that in front of you while Peter is talking. Um, so thank you, Peter. I'm going to just let you get on with it. Great. That's uh, that's an honor to be here. And uh, that uh, document that uh, Juliet referred to is a handout. And if uh, you haven't downloaded it, it might be good to do so. Uh, you could keep it in the background on your screen, or if you have a separate screen somewhere, you could put it there. Or uh, if you've got a printer handy, you could print it out. Uh, it would be useful for you to be able to refer to it from time to time as I go through. I've got a lot of content and um, the handout gives an outline of it. And I also, on the second page of the handout, there are references uh, for anyone who wants to know where you could find the uh, data that I'm going to be referring to or extended rationale for the things that I will only have time to kind of hint at in this talk. Um, so I've been for many years uh, studying children's play, uh, studying alternative approaches to education, um, uh, how children are designed to educate themselves when they have the opportunity to do so and the, and, um, and the freedom to do so. But today what I'm talking about is um, a crisis. Um, you know, we hear about crises all the time, unfortunately, in our world today. We have the crisis of global warming. We have the crisis of, uh, of the uh, coronavirus pandemic that hasn't really left us yet. We have the crisis of the rise of authoritarian dictators uh, in parts of the world where we thought this was over. Um, but we... Uh, but I'm going to talk about a different crisis, and it's a crisis that we aren't talking about enough as a culture, that people uh, have seemed to be kind of ignorant of this crisis. And the reason I think that we are kind of ignorant of it is because it's crept up on us. It's occurred gradually over time. Gradually over time, our children have become less and less free they become more and more constrained, less and less able to do what children are biologically designed to do. And the consequences of that have been disastrous. And I'm going to be talking about that um, in my talk today. So the title of the talk, if you've got the handout, you can see that there, how imposed schooling and over control are causing children to suffer. So, um, so the, if you're looking at the handout, we start with A, the de decline of play and of children's independent activities generally. For those of us who are over the age of 40 or 50, we've seen some of this in our lifetime, especially if you're, if you're my age, uh, we've seen a lot of this over. This is not something new. This is something that's been gradually developing over the past 60 years at least in the United States and in the UK and in many other parts of the world. Over the last 60 years in the United States, there's been a continuous, gradual, but ultimately huge decline in children's opportunities to play and opportunities to, in other ways, behave independently of adult monitoring, adult supervision, adult control. 
it's as if we're in a kind of experiment. What would happen if we deprived children of the freedom that children in the past have always had? Um, with the exception of those times and places where children have been slaves or have had been around the clock uh, or, or, or uh, in, in uh, very severe uh, uh, child labor situations, with those exceptions, children throughout time, as far as we know, and throughout place, as far as we know, have always had far more freedom to do their own things and have been far more trusted to do things independently of adult monitoring and control than our children are today. So let me document, let me say a little bit about how this has been documented. Uh, one historian who has written about it is Howard Chudikoff. He was focused on children in play in America. By the way, I should say that most of my data comes from the United States, not surprisingly, uh, since that's where I live, and it's also where most of the studies have been done. Uh, but there are many studies, there are quite a number of studies done in the UK, and I can say with considerable consequence, co uh, co uh, co considerable confidence that the UK is not very different from the United States. And I will present a little bit of data from the UK. The UK and the United States, in some sense, seem to be the world leaders in the control of children. Uh, Germany, not so bad. Finland, way better than us. <laughs> uh, but uh, we are kind of the leaders in what, ha what in in uh, in the over control of children and too much schooling, too much oversight, not enough freedom for children um, to be children. So. Um, but Chudikoff wrote about uh, children's play in America, and he referred to the first half of the 20th century as the golden age of children's play. He suggested that by the beginning of the 20th century, we had pretty much done away with serious child labor. We had child labor laws that uh, allowed children to regain the play that they had had in the distant past before uh, industrialization. Um, and, um, and children had a lot of free time, and there was a kind of valuation of, ch child, of childhood and under some understanding and even romanticization of childhood. But according to Chudikoff, beginning around uh, 1960, we began to take that freedom away. We took it away by increasing the amount of time they have to spend in school, by increasing the amount of time they spend in adult-directed activities rather than just going out and playing, by increasing the, uh, the emphasis to parents that children need to be monitored and directed and controlled, otherwise they're in danger or they may be dangerous to others. So we, uh, so, but this has been a gradual change. Um, not exactly linear, but more or less linear ever since about the 1960s. There was a kind of spurt of this change in the, 19, in the 1970s and especially in the 1980s. The 1980s was probably where the change occurred most dramatically. So it's people who, who uh, have lived uh, for a couple of decades before the 1980s who have seen this change in their lifetime. Social scientists have documented the change in a number of ways, both in the United States and the UK. There have been studies in which parents are asked uh, to estimate the number of hours a day that, or, or a week that their children have free to play and do their own thing. And then they're asked, uh, when you were your child's age, how much time did you have? And um, in all of these studies that have been conducted, the parents report having far more time than their own children do, at least twice as much time on average. And this is just over one generation, but we're actually talking about two or three generations when we talk about the period of time in which this change has occurred. Um, the, uh, and it's not just a decline in play. I tend to talk about it as a decline in play because I'm a specialist in play. But I recently read a book that I only recently discovered, even though it was, um, even though it was uh, published uh, almost published actually a decade ago. 
a book by a social scientist uh, named uh, Markella Rutherford, and the book is Adult Supervision Required. What Rutherford did was to uh, do a qualitative analysis of uh, articles in popular parenting magazines, uh, specifically parents and good housekeeping. These are popular magazines in the United States, read by parents, mostly moms, uh, that have been uh, in print, have been published uh, for more than 100 years. And so what she did is be, beginning in the early 19, in the early 20th century on through the early 21st century, she identified articles that had to do with advice to parents about their children or were columns written about um, children's experiences or were questions sent in by parents and did an analysis of hundreds of such articles to look for changes in the kinds of advice, the kinds of issues that parents were concerned about over this 100-year period. And what she found was dramatic changes. Uh, in the early, up until about the 1960s or so, the primary concern was getting children out of the house. <laughs> you didn't want children around. You wanted them to be independent. There was a lot of emphasis on that. They should, they should go themselves. You shouldn't have to take them places. Uh, a lot of emphasis on independence, a lot of understanding that children are spending a lot of time away from adults and that that's a good thing. There was talk about the kinds of part-time jobs that children had, uh, which is a way of their learning to be responsible, getting some sense of what it is to work. Uh, talk about the responsibilities of children at home, that children had chores to do, that they were expected to do, uh, and that they generally did do. Uh, so in other words, it's not just play, it's all kinds of sort of responsibility where there's an assumption that children are competent, they can do things, they're responsible, they can be responsible to do things at home and out of the home, they can be trusted. Um, and that, but that beginning around the 1960s just began to change and she points out that the change, as I just said, was most rapid really in the, in the late 1970s and through the 1980s, where the emphasis, instead of talking about children as competent and, and uh, reliable and resilient, the emphasis seemed to be on how fragile children are, how incompetent they are, how we've got to monitor and take care of them all the time. They're going to have some kind of emotional breakdown, God forbid, if they're bullied or they're going, so we've got to, we've got to keep watching them all the time. We've got to protect them all the time. We've got to keep them safe. Uh, this, our, this was, uh, as one example, she refers to an article in Parents Magazine uh, that was published in 2006 that had the frightening title, Are You a Good Mother? <laughs> and the basic answer that came through in that article was, well, you're a good mother if you're basically watching your child all the time. You're not a good mother if you're letting your child, or you're a negligent mother if you're letting your child go without some adult watching that child. So this was a dramatic change from what had been, occurred before. People who've studied children across culture, and, and especially in non-Western cultures, like David Lancey, who's written books on, the, on, the, on child, children across culture, an anthropologist, um, say that this is unique to our time and place. This is not something that really ever occurred in the past, this kind of overprotection of children, this kind of sense that children have to constantly be monitored and controlled or else they're in trouble. So what are the, uh, oh, another, another kind of data that has come about is, there's actually a fair number of research, mostly in Europe, um, on, um, on what's called children's independent mobility. To what degree are children able to move around in public spaces by themselves or with other children without an adult accompanying them? One measure of, of uh, children's independent mobility is what percentage of children are walking or bicycling to school by themselves or with their friends as opposed to either being driven or walking with parents and so on and so forth. So there was actually a study done by the uh, Policy Studies Institute in London that was comparing um, 
England with uh, Germany on uh, this dimension. A huge surveys done of, uh, of uh, what the researchers referred to as parental licenses. In other words, parental permissions for children to walk home from school themselves or to school themselves. Uh, what was found, and they did this study in 1971, again in 1990, and again in 2010. What they found was that in 1971, 86%, in other words, you know, almost all children who were of uh, elementary school age had permission to walk to school and back home themselves. By 19 uh, nine, by 1990, that was down to 35%, huge reduction, and it was mostly the older kids who were allowed to do that. By, 19, by 2010, even most of the older kids in elementary school weren't allowed to do that. It was way down to 25, only 25% had permission to walk to school or back. Without, uh, without being a company. They also asked about, in, uh, about uh, can they use public transportation, specifically buses by themselves without an adult accompanying them. Uh, and in 1971, 48% uh, of elementary school age children had permission from their parents to use public buses themselves. By uh, 1990, it was down to 15%, by 2010, down to 12%. So you can see from these data that the biggest changes actually occurred before 1990. There have been, con there have been continued declines in children's freedom since then. But the biggest changes occurred uh, in the 20th century up to about 1990, and the changes have been more gradual since that time. I don't have the data in front of me for Germany, but they have comparable data from Germany, which shows that the declines have been much less than, and there were uh, there than, than in the UK. There's other data in the United States, not exactly the same kind of study, suggesting that we're just as bad here on this measure as the UK is. Uh, the, the, the study in Finland, there's a study that was done actually including a number of countries, including Finland, showed that Finland has had almost no such decline. Children are still allowed a great deal of freedom, according to that study, for independent mobility, uh, to go out and play by themselves, and so on and so forth. As a side note, I might say that I've done a little research. Somebody's got a dog barking, so if you could mute, that would be help helpful. Uh, the, um, so, and so I, I might say I did a little research into whether the rise in mental disorder has occurred in Finland that's occurred elsewhere. And to the degree that I can tell from the data I've been found, find it has not. They have not had the same rise in mental disorder among uh, Finla, Finnish children that we've seen in the UK, in the US, in Australia, and various other countries where the uh, decline in children's freedom has been much greater than is true for Finland. So um, let me refer to one more study on uh, children's independent mobility. There's actually a little study done. This is sort of more of a demonstration, I suppose, than real evidence, because it wasn't a lot of families. But they, these researchers located um, some families that had for three generations lived in the same area in the UK. I don't recall what the area was, but it was a relatively safe place. It was a place where there had been really no big changes that could lead one to think it's more dangerous today than it was uh, decades ago. So they found families that had lived for three generations in the same house, in the same place. And they interviewed the grandparents, the parents, uh, about the mobility uh, that they had as children and also the mobility of the current children generation. And they asked how far, when you were a child, could you by yourself, when, when you were in the age range, I'm trying to remember the exact age range, oh, the age range of six to 10, uh, how far away from your home were you allowed to go without an adult accompanying? And for the grandparents, um, often they said, well, there was no limit. I could go wherever I wanted. 
uh, the median turned out to be about five kilometers, could go about five kilometers away from my home. For the parents, the children of these grandparents, well, they were asked, uh, how far could you go when you were between six and 10 years old? The, the median response was half a kilometer, down from five kilometers to half a kilometer. When those parents were asked, now your children between the age of six and 10, how far could they go away? Can they go away from home without adult accompaniment? The answer was nowhere, the, literally nowhere. They could not leave the front yard. <laughs> they could not leave their er the area. That was the median answer. Most of the respondents said, my children between six and 10, they've got to be in my sight all the time. Uh, they can't go, they can't leave. They can't leave an area that I can't see them. So this is this dramatically, maybe a little overly dramatically. I don't know how to what degree these families were selected and to what degree they're representative, but it was several families. And it illustrates how it illustrates, maybe in slightly exaggerated form, the degree of change that's occurred just over three generations in children's freedom of mobility. So I'm old enough that I've seen all of this change in my lifetime. I was a kid in the 1950s when we had enormous amounts of freedom. Uh, by the time I was five years old, I could go anywhere in the village that I lived in on my bicycle. Uh, and I wasn't unique. This was true for other kids too. Uh, if I went with my friend who was a few months older than me, Ruby Lou, I talk about her in my book, Free to Learn. If I went with her, I could go out of the village on my bicycle. We explored uh, large areas as little children uh, by bicycle. Bicycle, by the way, at that time was the equivalent for children to the car is today for adults. This was our wheels. This was how we got around. This is how we got places. This gave us freedom. And by the time I was five, I had a bicycle. I had to prove I could ride it and, uh, and uh, was trustworthy. But this is, uh, this is how I got around and kids got around. Everybody was moving around by bicycle. I don't know what it is like in the UK now, but I almost never see kids on bicycles today. If I see people on bicycles, they're adults wearing, wearing spandex and, and uh, fancy bicycling clothes and so on. <laughs> We just don't see kids on bicycles. So that's, uh, that's the, and I'm still a bicyclist. And so I'm out there all the time. If I see a kid on a bicycle, I would notice it. It's a real uh, surprise. Although I have to say that during the COVID pandemic, I did see some kids on bicycles. There was a kind of, uh, there was a kind of opportunity there that, um, that unfortunately has begun to disappear already. So at any rate, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, let me say something about the reasons. For, uh, the, let me also say that you know, at, when I was a kid, you could go, you could go anywhere in the United States that any time that it wasn't dark outside and that school wasn't in session, and you would find kids outdoors. You'd find them in vacant lots in cities. You'd find them on the streets. No adults around generally, or if there were, they weren't paying any attention to the kids. Kids created their own games, they created their own culture, and anthropologists tell us this is normal childhood. This is the way children lived in hunter-gatherer times, this is the way children live in, in, uh, in primitive agricultural cultures, and so on and so forth. This is not norm, what we have today is not normal childhood. I'm probably going to say that over and over and over again. Normal childhood was more like what we had in the 1950s. So that's um, the, the, so. So what what has been the cause of this decline? I I think there are three primary causes. There's actually a lot of things that I could talk about. There's a lot of changes in the culture that have contributed to this. Peter, we've lost your um, audio. 
Do you have it now? Uh, yeah, we do have it now. And I think if you just pick your mic up a little bit, it rubs against your shirt collar sometimes. Yeah, I think what I did is I accidentally, there's a little button on this uh, thing, and I think that I accidentally pressed it <laughs> to turn it off. And I think it's on now. But yeah, let me know good. if it goes off again. Yeah. So, um, so one is the spread of fears. Uh, we, uh, we have become convinced by the media, by supposed experts who are constantly warning us about the dangers out there, we have come to be afraid of the outdoors. We've become to be afraid that something terrible is going to happen to our children if we let them out without an adult uh, accompanying them. This fear is not, um, is not due to any real increase in crime. A lot of people think that it is, but the truth of the matter is that, the, at least in the United States, the crime rate is down between, uh, between at least between the 1970s and 80s, and it, down compared to what, what it, down today compared to what it is then. We don't have a lot of data from the 1950s. The kind of crime that people are most afraid of, that some stranger on the street is going to accost their, is going to uh, abduct their children or molest their child or uh, at worst murder their child, uh, that kind of crime is exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. We began to think it was common. In the United States, we began to think it was common in the 1980s. And I think that's one of the reasons why the 1980s was the time for the biggest change. There were a couple of very famous cases in the United States, and there may have been one in the UK too, of a young child actually being taken by a, a stranger and murdered. And that got, of course, in the news, a huge case was made about, remember, this is one child out of millions and millions of children who are out there, right? Or two children, actually, there were two cases. Uh, the result of that was that we began to hear public service announcements in the United States. Do you know where your child is today? Do you know you're where your child is right now? And the implication is you are a negligent parent if you don't. Milk cartons in the United States began to have pictures of missing children on them, and so you'd be, you, you know, you'd be eating your breakfast cereal with the milk carton there, and you'd be seeing these missing children, and you would think that the implication was these were all snatched away by strangers on the street. The truth of the matter is that most of those children on those milk cartons turned out to be runaways. They were not <laughs> snatched away. There's always been a certain number of runaways. And the actual data show that when children are snatched away, they're not generally snatched away on the street and they're not snatched away by strangers. They're snatched away uh, most often by relatives who uh, believe that the children are being neglected and not properly. So it might be the ex-husband or the ex-wife who's snatching the child away. Or, or, and even, and even when you look at, this, at, the, at the published cases of child molestation, it's not strangers on the street. It's priests, it's teachers, it's uncles, it's stepfathers, and so on and so forth who are doing it. One person, at least slightly tongue in cheek, I believe, said, You're your child is probably safer on the street than in church or in school or at home when your uncle's there. So this is, I'm not, I don't want to cast aspersions on priests and on teachers and uncles, but the actual data show that those are the far more likely molesters of young children than, of children than uh, strangers on the street are. So the, uh, so that's one of the causes. Of course, there realistically has been an increase in traffic, but the data show that it, even in places where there has not been an increase in traffic, kids, pe parents are still not letting their kids out. I've, you know, there's, there's actual data on this. I've actually gone back to, so I, we moved around a lot. Sometimes I lived in cities, sometimes in small towns. I've gone back kind of for nostalgic visits to a couple of the sleepy villages that I used to live in. And they're just as sleepy as they ever were. Uh, you could almost take a nap on Main Street in one of the in one of the towns I lived in, 
And even there, the kids are not being let out <laughs> without an adult accompanying them. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be traffic that's the determining factor, uh, although I could understand that in some places, of course, traffic is a problem, and especially since we're often not, at least in the United States, building sidewalks anymore. We're acting as if nobody's ever out there walking. Everybody's traveling by, um, by uh, automobile. Another change that I think isn't given enough uh, publication is that is the increase in what I call the weight of schooling. Schooling, certainly in the United States, and I can't speak with confidence in the UK, but I suspect the same is true there, but certainly in the United States, schooling occupies far more time than it did uh, in the 1950s when I was a kid. And it is far more stressful than when I was a kid. This has been especially true since the passage of the uh, No Child Left Behind uh, bill in the early 1980s uh, in the United States that has put a great emphasis on standardized testing and uh, given much less ability for teachers to respond to children's real needs. So children are being pressured to study uh, great amounts of time so that they can do well on these silly multiple choice standardized exams so that we won't be so embarrassed by the PISA scores <laughs> when we're comparing uh, US children on average with those in Singapore or elsewhere in the world that traditionally have higher scores on these kinds of tests. So, uh, but just to get, just by virtue of comparison, I looked up how long the school year was in the 1950s. There's actually data on this. The average school year in the United States was five weeks shorter when I was a kid in elementary school than it is today. The school day is a little, was a little bit shorter then. We had uh, on average six hour school days then. Now it's uh, on average for elementary school, six and a half to seven hours. But the biggest change has been in homework. Uh, when I was a kid in elementary school, there was no homework. Once in a while, a teacher would uh, ask us to write a poem or a, or, a, or a creative story at home. It was kind of fun. But we did not carry uh, books back and forth or worksheets back and forth. When we were home, we were home. <laughs> school was at school. And nor were our parents pressured to be uh, sort of assistant teachers who are supposed to monitor our homework, make sure we did it, and all of that. The result of this has been that even young children are now doing homework. Uh, so the school day doesn't end when the school day ends. And indeed, there is evidence that even for young children, the work week is as great or greater than the work week for their parents. <laughs> you know, we banned child labor, full-time child labor back around the beginning of the 20th century. Now we are putting them into schooling, which is in some ways the worst kind of child labor. It's sedentary, <laughs> it's micromanaged, it's child labor where you're constantly being evaluated and compared to, to your peers. I don't know anybody who would accept, any adult who would accept a job like that. But that's what we have put our children into. And it wasn't always like that. It's uh, not, I'm not saying school was great when I was a kid, but it was not nearly as bad as it is today. Uh, there was actually one study done in the United States that looked at, it was a study done that looked at how children's time is spent. It was a very well controlled study and they did the same study in 1981 and then in 2003. And for six to eight year olds, they found just between those two, just within that period of a couple of decades, they found an increase of 11.5 hours in the amount of time that six to eight year olds were spending doing schoolwork, counting being at school plus doing homework at home. Increase of 11.5 hours, that's like adding one and a half eight hour workdays to children's work life 
to six and eight year old children's work life <laughs> just over a 20 year period. I think any of us would rebel <laughs> if this tried to happen to us, but we don't seem to rebel when it happens to our children. We seem to actually support it in one way or another because we, ha we, we believe that all this schooling is good for our children despite the evidence that it's not. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the increase. And then besides the increase in amount of school and the amount of homework, we've developed what I often refer to as a schoolish view of child development. Element. This whole school mentality has taken over how we think about children. We think about children as school children. <laughs> and we think about them as school, as school children even when they're not in school. We've developed a view kind of that children's own activities are sort of a waste of time. And that children develop best when they're carefully monitored and taught and directed and so on by adults. So even when children are not in school, we tend to put them in school-like activities. Instead of just going out and playing football or baseball or whatever they played in the past, doing it in their own way, making up their games, we put them in a formal adult-directed team <laughs> where they're, again, they're managed by adults. There's a certain amount of pressure about it. There's trophies on the line. Do you make the team or not make the team? Very different from play. So we're putting them more and more into adult directed activities, even when they're not in school. So I want to move on, I'm moving on now to B on the handout, psychological consequences of the decline of play and independence. So over this same 60 year period that play has declined, we've seen huge increases in the rates of mental disorder in children, adolescents, and young adults, young adults who grew up under these conditions of uh, lack of play and lack of freedom. The clearest data in the United States comes from, uh, from studies of, of depression and anxiety and suicide among, among uh, young people. Uh, it turns out that there are certain clinical assessments for depression and anxiety that have been given in unchanged form over the decades to normative groups of young people, well, mostly high school students and college students, but some of them have, there, there are even some forms that have been given for younger children. Analyses of these over the years show that if you look for the depression um, and the anxiety studies, if you look at what today on these questionnaires would be the cutoff point for suspected major depressive disorder or suspected uh, generalized anxiety disorder, the rates of these disorders today among young people are between five and eight times what they were in the in the 19 um, in the 1950s uh, in fact or and also between the 1950s and 1960s there was very little change in that period of time in fact those data come from studies that were done uh, very, at the very beginning of the 20th century we know that there have been even further increases since then I would suspect that it's about it's about eight to ten times the rate if we were to be, take those further studies into account today the suicide rate according to the CDC Center for Disease Control data which keeps these data in the United States the suicide rate for school age children is uh, six times what it was to now six times what it was in the in the 1950s and this has been a gradual increase over this period of time there's been a sudden spurt of it uh, just lately um, so these are these are very serious consequences um, suicide is now the second biggest cause of death for children in, um, uh, in uh, for school age children uh, the um, the uh, why so the, the this is a correlation that I've, I've described uh, the decline in children's freedom and I've described Describe the rise in uh, mental illness and suicide. 
that's a correlation that doesn't prove cause and effect. But there's logical reason as well as empirical reason for believing that there's, this is a cause effect relationship. First of all, what do you expect to happen if you take play away from children? Life without play is pretty depressing, especially for children. There was one of the uh, one uh, play researcher used to say that uh, the opposite of of play is not work; it's depression. Um, depression is the absence of play and the playful spirit that uh, the spirit that accompanies play. Of course, children are going to be depressed if they're constantly being controlled and regulated and you know we, it doesn't seem like something where we actually have to even have empirical data to prove that there's a cause effect relationship there moreover if we take children out of their situation of play and just being children and we put them more or less always into settings like school and adult directed activities where they're still being monitored and judged all the time we're putting them into anxiety provoking situations of course they're going to be more anxious because of the situation what would we possibly expect you deprive children of the ways that they relax and you put them more and more into anxiety situ producing situations and you're going to get more anxiety so that's um so so it seems to be me to be a no-brainer that there would be a cause effect relationship between the two but there's another point i want to make here which also helps explain the um the uh, the change uh, the change and that is that the, the increase in psychopathology among children. And that is another clinical questionnaire that's been given over the decades is a questionnaire that assesses what's called internal versus external locus of control. Uh, this has been, there's a test of this for children which has been given over the decades to normative and quasi-normative groups of children. It basically assesses the degree to which children believe they are in control of their own fate versus the degree to which they uh, believe that, that their fate is controlled by chance, by powerful other people, by things beyond their control. Now it turns out there's a lot of evidence that it's useful to have an internal locus of control, to believe that you control your own fate. There's evidence, not surprisingly, mostly studies with adults, that shows that people who don't have an internal locus of control are very likely to become anxious or depressed at some point in their life. Not surprisingly, if you believe anything can happen at any time and there's nothing you can do about it, you can't solve these problems, you can't control your fate, life is pretty depressing and also pretty anxiety provoking. So. How do, how do children develop this internal locus of control, the sense that they can control things, if we never let them control things? <laughs> Play is where children are in control. Independent mobility is where children are in control. Having a part-time job that's not directly supervised are places where children are in control learn that they can control themselves, that they can solve their own problems, and so on and so forth. Take all that away and you're not going to get high internal locus of control. That's what the studies have shown. There's been a huge decline in internal locus of control. So here we have, in addition to everything else I said, the supports the cause effect relationship. Here we have a causal change. You don't have experience with controlling your own behavior. You don't develop an internal locus of control as a result of that internal locus of control, lack of internal locus of control sets you up for anxiety and depression. <clears throat> I'll be very quick on this. I want to sort of speed up a little bit because I want to leave a little time at the end for questions and discussion. Um, but the um, but one more point I want to make, there's actually evidence you can, I've got, a, I've got references here if you want to look it up. I've also got a blog post on it. There's actually very convincing evidence that creativity among young people has also declined 
as a result of the changes we've made. Play is the most creative thing that one can do. We've removed a lot of the creative activities from school. Children are spending a lot of time doing the least creative thing you can possibly do, which is to study for one answer multiple choice tests. The consequence of that is there has been, based on actually, believe it or not, a standardized way of assessing creativity, a huge decline in uh, creative ability among young people in the United States at all grade levels in school. And this is at a time when we need creative people more than ever before. The non-creative jobs no longer exist. We, they've been taken over by robots and computers and so on. We need people in the workplace who can think of problems problems that haven't been solved yet and figure out how to solve them, who can create new things and so on and so forth. And yet we've got a schooling system that uh, suppresses creativity more than ever than it ever did before. And we've got uh, parental ex uh, uh, practices that by virtue of not providing adequate time for real play and adequate opportunity are also suppressing the development of creativity. So um, I want to, I've already said something about, I'm going to kind of skip over C on this. We can discuss it a little bit. Uh, I want to say something about, we're going skipping down to D on the handout, self-determination theory, explanation of young people's suffering. Another way of thinking about this whole thing is in terms of what psychologists refer to as self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is sort of a, is a domain of psychological research and theory that was named about 30 years ago uh, and developed initially by Richard Ryan and Edward Dacey, researchers in the United States who are still at it and have published a number of books on it. And there are now dozens and dozens of researchers who are studying what they call self-determination theory. The fundamental premise of self-determination theory is that people of all ages perform better, live more satisfying lives, report themselves to be happier when they feel that they are in that they are doing things that they themselves decided to do <laughs> people are far less happy far less successful far less productive when they believe that they are what they're doing is something that they have to do that's been more or less forced upon them by others so you are you function better and you you are mentally more healthy when you have the sense that you are doing things that you want to do, your internal drive to do them. This, ha this encompasses all kinds of activities, your work, your happier, your work. If you have control over that work, you believe you have control, that you want to do this as opposed to you have to do this. So we have ch moved children's lives away from their being able to do what they want to do to more and more doing what they have to do. Everything in school, pretty much, is what you have to do. Recess, by the way, also has been more or less removed from schooling in the United States or greatly reduced. So even that has been, even that, that little respite has been taken away from many children in the United States. So one of the sub theories of uh, self determination theory is what is what uh, the researchers call um, basic drives theory and the idea is that there are three basic psychological drives that are essential to really feel that you are in control of your own life one of them is autonomy. I can make my own decisions. The decisions aren't being made by other people for me all the time. I can make my own decisions. I have autonomy. I have freedom. The second is that I'm competent. Not only can I decide what I want to do, what paths I want, but I'm competent. I can do those things. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, I, I can figure out what I need to do. I can solve the problems related to it, this sense of competence. And then third, so, so autonomy, competence, and then the third drive is the drive for relatedness. We as social beings need social support in order to follow our own paths. We feel estranged if we're taking a path and we feel nobody supports this path. Nobody, we don't, we need the emotional support of friends and colleagues for what we're doing. Now the point I want to make 
is play is how children develop all of these. Play is autonomy. Play by definition is something that the child freely chooses as opposed to something that is imposed upon the child. Play is how children develop competence in the things that they love to do. Play is how they fig figure out what they love to do and they play at things to become and become good at those things and they develop a sense of competence as a result of playing at those things. Similarly, part-time jobs. If you have a part-time job, you're you're learning to be competent. You're learning, I can do this. I can do a job. I can be like an adult in the sense that I can do my paper route. I can do babysitting. I can do delivery, whatever it was I was doing. These are the kinds of jobs I had when I was 11 or 12 years old and were very common and not common today in the United States. And play is how children make friends. Children play socially. Play is how children develop relationships with other children. Play is how children learn to get along with other children. Deprive children of play and we're depriving them of the three basic psychological needs. And no surprise then that the result is that we find a decline in mental well-being of children. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to at this point bring it to a close. Now I do have E here on the handout, how to restore play and self-determination. Maybe I'll spend one minute. I've, I'm told we can go a little bit beyond the end of the hour. Is that true? Okay, so I'm gonna maybe spend one minute on E just to say, or a couple minutes on E, just to say that um, there are some uh, promising uh, developments. One is that in the United States is that there's a huge increase in homeschooling. Many, many families are recognizing that school is harmful for their children and they're taking their children out of school. An increasing number of families are doing it and they're doing it for that reason. Decades ago, most homeschoolers were doing it for religious reasons. They were doing it because they, they wanted to raise their children in a belief system that they valued and they felt was undermined by schooling. That's no longer true. Most people in the United States who are homeschooling today are doing so because they are finding that the school system is upsetting their children, making their children miserable, making their children angry and so on and so forth. And so they're taking their children out of school. Homeschooling is easy in the United States, at least legally easy in every state in the United States. Among homeschoolers, more and more are adopting unschooling, which is basically allowing the child to determine their own interests and facilitating the child in those interests rather than imposing some kind of strict curriculum on the child. Uh, the rate of homeschooling, as I said, increase, has been increasing and it really jumped during the corona pandemic and it's still high as the pandemic is declining. A Gallup poll conducted shortly before the before the pandemic started indicated that 5% of American families with school age children were homeschooling their kids. Uh, a year later, it was up to 10% and it's now even a little higher than that. And it looks like so far, it looks like most of those people didn't decide to homeschool just during the pandemic that they are sticking with it. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why they began to homeschool. But one of the reasons is that because uh, schooling was online for a period of time, parents got a sense of what schooling was like. And they said, no wonder my kid doesn't like it. And uh, I can do better than that. <laughs> and what they're learning isn't all that important. Uh, and so they, they gave parents that didn't have the courage to do it before the courage to do it. Interestingly, in the United States, the jump in homeschooling has been especially high for black families. Um, before the pandemic, the schooling rate was three, homeschooling rate for black families was 3%. It jumped up to 16% after the pandemic and seems, as far as I can tell, to be holding there. I don't have real recent data. So this is not just white middle class families. This is black families as well. And, um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, homeschooling has been especially attractive for black families and why there's been this movement. So that's one thing that's happened. In addition to that, there are things that are beginning to happen in public schools. Um, I've played some role in that along with Lenore Skenazy, who wrote the book Free Range Kids. Uh, 
she's the president of an organization called Let Grow, which you might be interested in looking at at some point. I gave the website to it on your handout. I've been working with Lenore through Let Grow to work in regular public schools to bring more play and self-direction in those schools. We work with superintendents who recognize some of the problems that I've just described and are working to bring real play into the schools. Some of the schools have adopted what's called Play Club, uh, which was sort of my invention, which is an hour uh, of free play where all the kids in the school, in the elementary school, that's typically age five through 11, are all playing together, age mix, maybe 100, 150 kids all playing, and the, pretty much the whole school is open for play. And the, in, and the people monitoring are told to not intervene unless they absolutely have to. This has been a great success in a growing number of schools are doing it. We've also instituted uh, what's, what, uh, what Lenore refers to as the Let Grow Project in schools, which is a very simple thing. Teachers give an assignment to their children, to the children in their classroom, to do something outside of school that's a little bit scary for them, a little bit new to them, and, uh, and to report back on it, and that they have to negotiate with their parents to get permission to do it. And so the child decides, what is it I would like to do that I've been a little afraid to do or that my parents haven't allowed me to do? Maybe it's ride my bicycle to my friend's house, you know, down the block. <laughs> or maybe it's uh, to be able to cook a meal all by myself. Uh, uh, and they at any rate, they then talk with their parents about it, they negotiate, they find if, if the parent doesn't allow them to do what their first choice is, they're supposed to negotiate, find some something that they're allowed to do, and then they report back. Well, the genius of this is it's homework. <laughs> so the parents have to take it seriously. So the parents take seriously, okay, my child has to do these things, it's a little bit scary. It's a little scary for me to allow my child to do it, but I better allow my child to do it at least some some degree of it. And then it turns out the result of this, what we found and which Lenore predicted would happen based on her prior experiences, is that the, not only is the child proud of doing this thing that they never had done before, but the parent is proud of the child and proud of, the, of herself or himself for allowing the child to do it. And now that parent is ready to allow the child to do something even a little more adventurous. And so each Let Grow project becomes a little more adventurous than the previous one. It sort of breaks into this cycle and starts a cycle of the parent becoming more and more trustful, more and more willing to um, uh, allow the child to do something that requires a little bit of courage. So those are some of the things that are happening that um, after this very depressing talk, are happening that uh, we can smile about <laughs> and that we can think are leading to maybe some changes that will be helpful in the future. So let me stop at this point and maybe we can spend at least a few minutes with, um, with uh, questions and discussions. Thank you, Peter. And I don't think you'll get anyone rushing to, you know, to kick you out. So um, I think they're, they're really just happy to hear from you. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, there's a lot of food for thought because I certainly remember having a much freer childhood, you know, under the age of five, being able to go and wander down the road. Um, and we used to go and take a picnic and uh, go off on our own, me and my younger brothers. And um, and actually, we would we would think it was lunchtime and we'd come back. It wasn't even 12 yet, you know, so we'd have eaten our picnic already. But um, just because children have no concept of time <laughs> and it was good fun. Um I, I think we all in agreement with you, and certainly here in the UK, the Good Childhood Report uh, shows that British young people are amongst the least happy in the world, um, which is rather telling. And yet we find that the policymakers ignore it all and just think that more hours in school will somehow fix the problem um, or more adult controlled play and um you know all very managed and controlled so there have been a lot of comments in the chat um you know obviously the issue is like if you live in a very busy traffic area you know there is a worry um and i, I know uh, i was watching a japanese program where they let toddlers basically go out on their own and they just follow them with a film crew i'm sure you would have seen that it's quite comical and how well they 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 cross the road and everything when they've been taught they send them on shopping errands actually 
to see if they can get get the order right and they they do, do really it's really interesting um and uh, uh, there's another interesting uh, video by i think the one of the previous ceos of the lego foundation on this is your brain when you are playing i don't know if you've ever seen it but it's a really lovely lovely talk to watch um so i uh, i'm always suggesting it to everybody um, so does anyone have any specific questions? Um, you know, you've got Peter here right now, if you want to ask him. Um. Maybe while well, people are coming up with questions, I couple, co comment on a couple of things you said. It's also the case here that there's a lot, there's a recognition among everybody that there is an increase in, um, in uh, mental disorder among children and we have to do something about it. But what are people doing? more and more therapy. It's as if the problem lies within the child and we need more therapy. So schools, instead of adding more play and subtracting all the pressure, what they're doing is hiring more child therapists. <laughs> yeah. And they're doing, they're doing things like yoga and, and meditation to try to learn to relax. Instead of getting at the real cause, <laughs> yeah. the, fact that, the fact that it's school that's causing this, Yes, well, we've Let's seen admit that, that. Means... they're not admitting that they're they're thinking and everybody wants to attribute this to anything but schooling they want to attribute it to social media video games they want to attribute it to somehow some problem with parents or some problem you know something in the air <laughs> you know there yeah. nobody almost nobody is admitting this is school and yet it's yeah. if you ask kids so there was a study done, one of the studies I should have mentioned earlier, the study done of stress in America a few years ago, done by the American Psychological Association. And they interviewed people of all ages, they surveyed people across the country, normatively chosen, but of all ages, about the stress they were experiencing, how much stress they were experiencing. They concluded that high school kids are the most stressed out people in America. And when they asked the question, what is the source of your stress? 83% said school. That never made it into the public media. It simply was not picked up by the public media. You have a tiny little suggestion that social media causes anxiety. That's in the headlines everywhere. There's a big, in popular magazines, there's big articles about how the iPhone is destroying a generation. The data are very slim on that, whereas the data are remarkable on the role of school. It's also the case, let me point out, that suicides are double. The rate of suicides are for school-age children, but not for anybody else, are twice as high when school is in session than during uh, vacations from school. So are mental disorders uh, among children, emergency visits to the, uh, for mental reasons among children are at least twice as high when school is in session than when it's not. Again, these data don't get into the popular press. School has a halo around it. Nobody is willing to say school is the problem here. Yeah. Yeah, it's that uh, the emperor's got no clothes. Nobody's willing to say, you know. Um, and I think that is the same here, very much so. They skew the figures. So they'll often say, oh, this and this percentage are like that. But the actual, the reverse percentage is actually bigger. You know, so they kind of just, just uh, the way they, they spin it. Um, and of course, there's that meme that's, which is about, you know, when a plant isn't thriving, you don't try and force it. You, you know, you move the plant to an environment that's more conducive. You know, and um, it's it's very much that that is the case. So I see Alison has her hand up. So if she wants to join us with a question, hi Peter, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. I've um, read your work for a number of years and uh, use it frequently um, in in running my charity, the Centre for Personalised Education. Um, firstly, I did put that information that you have just talked about in the chat um, from your study in uh, 2018 um, about your, your the, the connection between school and um, holidays and term time and, and mental health. So I, I, I did actually stick that in the chat when you were talking about Thank it. You. You're welcome. Um, we have a problem in this country at the moment in that um, a, a sustained misinformation campaign 
from um, people who run children's services in this country has resulted in some appalling legislative proposals which hit um, us a week ago yesterday. Um, and I, I was in a meeting with the Department for Education this morning, actually talking about this legislation, um, uh, uh, talking about its impact, etc. And I completely agree with you that they can't see that school is the problem. They're scared witless that there's an increase in home education, and they think the solution to that is to force more children back into school by saying that by by making the the, the um, their ability to have a free education narrower and narrower and narrower so that you fall off the sides and then you get sent back to school because it's not the right education so my question really is um how do we ch change the narrative that school is holy that school is the answer to everything yeah it's a great place for some children my my, my son never went to school my daughter chose to go to school when she was 11 so and she really enjoys it she's very very academic but but how do we change the narrative that school is the answer to everything and that school is safe because school is absolutely not safe for a massive number of children and we also have enormous school refusal figures here so that's the children who can't go because they are anxious or, or whatever and they're anxious for good reason it's not a phobia it's a real thing something's happened at school that you know shakes them they might be autistic they might be triggered they might might have had a bad experience they might have been bullied so how do we kind of change society's narrative and change the media's narrative to recognize these problems rather than just following the rhetoric of people that run children's services who who just seem to like to make work for themselves and make themselves feel important yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I've been trying to do that for a couple of decades now <laughs> without without great success, but with some. And I think that what we need, what we really need is more and more people to speak the truth. We need people willing to speak the truth. We need teachers who are willing to stand up. In the United States, sometimes I'll give a talk similar to what I've just given to a large group of teachers. And afterwards, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody will raise their hand and they'll say, well, I agree with everything you've said, but what I have to say is we teachers are no more free than the kids. And my response to them is that's not true. The kids are required to be there by law. You are not. <laughs> you could strike for something other than higher wages. <laughs> you could strike for a better environment for your children. We need teachers who understand it because there are an increasing number of teachers who do understand it to stand up and use some courage. There was a case in Brookline, Massachusetts, not far from where I live, a, a, a affluent city where the Oops. Oh, so Peter frozen on us a bit there. Okay, so Peter, hopefully you will make it. You will. Uh, you're hanging by a thread. Hopefully you'll get back in here. So, so one of the th the things that we've come up with in our group is to start telling real stories about real people, to kind of put the flesh on the bones of 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 the problem. Um, so that, you know, and say this system doesn't work for this person and this is why. And I, I think those personal stories are going to be really, really important going forward. Yeah. Um, it looks like we've lost Peter. We can wait and see if he makes it back in uh, just a, a few minutes. Um, you know, I think I'm I think I'm on now. Are you there? Let's find you yeah. in the spotlight. So, can somebody find Peter? So just uh, are you hearing me? OK. Yeah. Okay, so so that but the point is that they they recognized it, but the petition went nowhere. They did not end up striking. They recognized it. I hear I've heard from we have many many people leaving teaching because of all of this. They're leaving it, but the result of that is the best teachers are going. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so we need something other than teachers leaving it. We need a press who's willing, people who are willing to speak out against school. They're just not willing to do it. Nobody's willing. Ever. It's like, it's like you're, there's something wrong with you if you say that there's something wrong with the way we're doing schooling. And um, that's, that needs to change. I think it is I think it is changing a little bit. I think that we're beginning to see more people, but we need we need to get the data out there. We need to we need to we need to show people. We need to convince people that the problem it's not just school. It's the fact that our children are over controlled. One way that I that I present it often to adults is imagine that your life was controlled in the same way that your child's life is. How would you feel? <laughs> How would you feel? You had no privacy. People are always watching you. People are always measuring you. Imagine a job where you're constantly being compared to your workmates. You're not allowed to discuss the problems with your workmates because that's cheating, right? You're not allowed to go to the bathroom even without asking for asking for permission. Yeah. You're, you're micromanaged. This would be a job from hell. <laughs> Nobody would take it, uh, even for the highest possible pay. Um, and yet this is what we want our children to be. This should be obvious to people, but we've got to put, we've got to just continuously put it out there to people people they're so conditioned aren't they people to, to to because the people running the system have been to school themselves so for them that's their normal and because that's their normal they can't think outside of that normal and and the alternatives frighten them tomorrow we've got naomi fisher speaking haven't we and yeah. she she has a lot to say about this she has a lot of a lot of research on on the stresses of school and she's got some amazing stories and while you were disconnected i was saying that i think one of the ways that we can we can change the landscape is to tell personal stories of how things affect children affect our, our children and our families and keep those stories coming out make it make it real right. it is very interesting to me the the way these like almost you know the the blinkers um and how how big those blinkers are to to things that are actually staring us in the face, and and the research is out there. The research exists, and uh, it just gets ignored uh, entirely. Uh, there was a question from Elizabeth. Uh, she said, "Have you read the stuff on iGen and Gen Z suggestion that the big change is the smartphone, social media, etc.? Can you comment on this? Did the rise in depression and suicide predate the availability of the smartphone?" Or has it increased more rapidly since then? Yeah, the biggest change occurred before that. <laughs> the biggest change occurred in the in the late 1970s into 1990, before most kids had iPhones. So, uh, moreover, um, the data simply are not there. The um, Jean Twenge did this study that gets quoted a lot, where this was a database where there were many, many thousands of um, of uh, young people involved in the database. They filled out a long survey with lots of questions, and then there were many, many different kinds of studies. And so what she did is look to see if there's a correlation between measures of anxiety that occurred in that study and 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 uh, social media. There had already been a lot of studies about about uh, video games and there's zero evidence that video games is a cause of these problems. I think everybody knows that now. So she was looking at social media, which is now the villa, considered to be the villain. What she found was, not predicted that it would be gender specific, but what she found was for girls and young women, a very tiny but statistically significant correlation between the use of social media and um, and anxiety. It accounted for one third of one percent of the variance. This is an effect that's only statistically significant because the n was so large. If, if you've got a lot of subjects, you can have a tiny effect, and it still meets the. It's still statistically significant. But is that meaningful? It's such a tiny effect. Is it meaningful? Secondly, that doesn't prove cause and effect. I mean, even if there was a correlation, maybe it's because you're, maybe because you're anxious, you're using social media more. Maybe because you you feel anxious, you're less likely to go out and meet friends, and so you do meet people the only way you feel you can meet them. Or maybe you're even using social media to try to solve your problem. You know. 
it simply doesn't show what it's claimed to show. And there are various other studies, some of which show the opposite, some of which show that kind of an effect, some of which show no effect. The evidence is so scanty. The problem is that we adults, especially those of us who grew up without all of this, we're always, we always are suspicious of, the, of what the young people are doing. We're always suspicious. We always think that the new technology is destroying the new generation. This has been true probably since the dawn of humanity. Every generation thinks that the new generation is doing things that's harming them uh, on their own. And therefore, we want to control them more <laughs> rather than give them more of a, options. And so the bias is there and anything that tends to support that bias gets uh, exaggerated in the popular press. I've written a number of blog posts on this for people who are interested. I do a regular mm -hmm. blog for Psychology Today and you can find where I've reviewed, yes. reviewed the data on these I would issues. strongly recommend going and finding Peter, following him and this is always a lot to, to um, to follow and you know you've got articles you've been writing for years years ago you've been saying this stuff and it's, it's nothing's been done really to to change anything i, I would like to just give randall a, a chance I, I understand we are stretching your time but uh, randall has a question if you don't mind sure randall you muted? Uh, i think you're muted yeah so sorry about that um first a comment just on this fact that the system cannot face up to its failings i've just put two links to um daycare research in sweden into the chat that shows that mental health problems are growing where children are in daycare from age zero onwards but it also points out that nobody in sweden wants to tackle the issue they they want to deny that it's that is the cause um, that type of thing is always going to happen um, where we, where a system invests in some a project as big as state education, because once it started investing, it cannot say we've been wasting our money for the last hundred years. We've been putting children through misery for the last hundred years. And the more it gets, but my question I put in the chat earlier, and it's more a thought provoker. Why are we content to do away with autonomy for children and therefore for citizens as they get older? Because if you learn to do what you're told when you're younger, as you get older, you still conform. Um, and why is society content to do that? Is there any cultural things? We've been through massive cultural change in my lifetime. Is there anything in that cultural change of the framework of Western societies that actually mean that um, people are more content to give up autonomy? Um, or is it just all down to schooling that we've had several generations of schooling now so parents think i gave up my autonomy they should we actually had have a heritage where free will and choice it was sacrosanct and we now um do that peter i don't know if you've got any you know we're giving that up I don't know if <laughs> well, there's a thought. there's a lot in what you said let me let me first uh respond by uh, 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 by a study that reinforces uh, your first point. The, uh, there, there was a study done uh, in uh, the state of Tennessee in the United States. Um, Tennessee had um, decided that the reason that people from poor families are doing worse in school is because they aren't starting school, they aren't learning uh, academic skills early enough. They're not learning it at home. So Tennessee instituted a very expensive statewide free uh, preschool program that would be academically uh, oriented and, and you had to be below the poverty line to send your kids to it. So the belief was, uh, so I put a lot of money into this, the belief was this would reduce the gap, the academic gap between rich and poor in Tennessee. Um, 
the uh, the study uh, they didn't the, the because there were more families who wanted to put their child in than they had room for in the first years. This offered the opportunity for an experiment. So they randomly decided which families would, which kids would be in the program and which would not. So they now had a controlled experiment. The kids in the program and the control group were just home in their poor families, right? Uh, and they followed these kids up through sixth grade. By sixth grade, by every single measure that they used, the kids who were in that program were doing worse than the kids who had just been at home during that period and by every measure considerably worse they were doing worse on academic tests they were doing worse socially emotionally they were more likely to get into trouble in school there was more of them had been diagnosed with a learning disorder which doesn't surprise me when you pressure little kids to learn stuff that to do stuff that they're not ready to do do and don't want to do. They develop blocks, which get diagnosed as learning disorders. There was a 50% lower rate. It turns out Tennessee also assesses kids for giftedness. There was a 50% lower rate of assessed giftedness in the kids. By every measure, this program was harming the children compared to just being home in these families that the state believed were not good families for kids to develop in, right? So the uh, heard about this study from a legislator uh, from uh, New, from Tennessee who called me and who said, told me before this was ever published, he told me about the results and he said, the legislature is trying to suppress these results because they're committed to this program. <laughs> and I think it's exactly what you said. It's the, we've devoted some money in it. We've propagandized in it. We believe in it despite what the science tells us. <laughs> There's, here in America, we're very good at denying science. And uh, this was an, was an example of denying the results of science. Ultimately, it did get published and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it and especially discussion because uh, uh, Biden wants a uh, universal preschool. <laughs> and so we need to be sure if there's going to be universal preschool across all the states that it be play based and not academic. And I've been really uh, on a bandwagon about that. In terms of your question about why is this, I, I think you answered your own question as well as I could. Um, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, we're creatures of norms. You know, we've all been to school. Our parents went to school, our grandparents went to school. We've been hearing propaganda about school for, forever. Uh, it's very hard. It's very uh, hard to stand up and say school is, uh, turns out not to be a good thing, at least not as much school as we have. We need less school rather than more of it in the face of so much propaganda, so much strong belief in school. It takes a certain amount of courage to do that. And especially takes courage for parents to say, I'm taking my kid out of school. I'm doing this strange thing, this unusual thing. As it becomes, it's becoming easier in the United States because more and more people are doing it and therefore it's not as strange, it's not as unusual. I might also say that I'm not sure that we have totally given up on the idea that we really do need to suppress free will. The original purpose of school, I've written about this, and if you look at the history of schooling, the, the first schools that are like schools that we have today uh, were developed during the Protestant Reformation, uh, most fully in Prussia, uh, uh, but also throughout Europe in the colonies in the United States, and their explicit purpose was to drive the sinfulness out of children. Free will is the source of sinfulness. You've got to teach obedience. You've got to suppress children's free will. And you've got to indoctrinate them with biblical doctrine. That was, those were the purposes of school. And school was developed in order to do that. It turns out that you suppress free will by simply imposing these requirements and reinforcing them, insisting that they do it instead of doing what they might want to do. That's how you kill free will. Indoctrination you do by repeating things over and over again and making them repeat it, making them feed it back. 
and people know that's how you indoctrinate. So they would indoctrinate biblical doctrine. The lessons were all about biblical doctrine. And, um, and that was the explicit purpose. I, you read the manuals for schoolmasters then, and it was stated, you know, if, if you have done your job, if you remove the, replace the free will uh, in children with their desire to do what they're told to do, and you will have done your job if they come out believing in, um, in, the, in the fundamentals of, of, of Christian religion. That's where schools originated and they eventually were taken over by the state with different kinds, somewhat different ends but uh but they, they were designed for a particular purpose <laughs> and you can't change that they're, they're structured in such a way i mean think about it the only way that you can fail in school in our typical schools is by not doing what you're told to do if you do what you're told to do you will pass <laughs> no matter who you are if you don't do what you're told to do you will fail so there's no question but what the real lesson of school even today is obedience we don't say that, but to what degree at some level of our thinking do we believe that that's the proper purpose of school? Right. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think to some degree we still want school to do that. I, I, th I agree with you, um, Peter, that the early schools, I think Gatto actually laid it at the um, feet of Martin Luther going to the Prussian governors and say i haven't found the reference if you know where it is i'd love it um saying to the prussian politicians unless you start your schools the catholic church will always raise the next generation and so it's always been about that but i sense there is something else going on because behind the christian religion there is actually a god who gives people a free will now we've moved on since then in our culture and we're now into the place where biological evolution has done away with free will and there is more and more a narrative that by shaping the future generation you can control their minds and how they evolve i mean we go back to so many things um darwin's um cousin was very much into eugenics and things like that. And this is manipulating the population because they're nothing more than biological machines. And I think if you look at some of the stuff that's being talked about in international levels, you hear that type of language today. And so I think the heart, because in some of the religious organizations and some of them have been terrible, you know, you've got across the borders from you, you've got the Canadian situation with the um, original with the native people being done it happened in Australia it's happened I think in America as well where schools and religious schools have been used really harshly but also behind that that religion I don't like the word religion um, there's a difference between faith and religion I'm not going into it but there is a lot of faith behind it that says when God created you, he gave you a free will. And every one of us has a right to exercise that. And I would say this, what was started by religion is now been escalated by the growth of secularism that believes we're nothing more than biological machines because it's no empathy, it's no concern for the individuals randall i think you're taking on a whole new topic I have. Um, oh. and it and and it and it is a fascinating one but we've gone like half an hour over so i'm yeah i, I, think I, think I'll, I will zip it. i will draw the line there i think um because i think ultimately it's it ends up being a uh, human beings who want to control and want everyone to conform you know at the end of the day and i think for whatever reason there's there's can be many many um uh agendas behind wanting control and conformity. There are a lot of other questions, but I don't think we can get to them. So please, uh, we have got a c community boards. If you want to go and, and uh, get conversations, you know, join, start up a conversation there. Um, and there's lots of other ways we can organize to have chats and discussions around these things. But this has been a fascinating discussion. Peter, lots of uh, 
comments in in the you know just the comments have just gone mad the chats so um thank you very very much for giving us uh, your time today we really appreciate it and thank, thank you all for for uh, for your attention and for the questions for a lot of these things that i see people are raising um you could find essays that I've written on these questions uh, on my Psychology Today blog. I, by now, you could look at the table of contents mm -hmm. of that. And for anybody who's interested in them, my academic articles, which are all written in easy to read manner, um, you can find those articles on the author page of my Psychology Today blog if anybody's interested. So um, if you want to follow yeah. up in some ways, that's one way to do it. So um, great to meet you all. Maybe someday we'll meet in person. Yes. Oh, I do hope that. Thank you so much, <laughs> Peter. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.